The Star Wars galaxy has seen the rise and fall of some pretty unique and interesting military organizations. Today, we're gonna dive into the lore of the four main militaries from the Galactic Civil War and the Clone Wars, and I'm going to make my case for which one is the best in design, strength, and in operation. So basically, what's the best military from the Star Wars galaxy? A military is measured in a number of ways. Today we'll be looking at the strength and the application of that strength to serve their mission, and the ability to maintain that strength till the mission or campaign is over. Ground rules. If we're comparing pure firepower at the height of their power, then everything would probably go to the Empire. No faction in the two prime timelines of the Clone Wars or the Galactic Civil War can stand up to just the pure scale of the Imperial Navy. So up on the block, we've got the Grand Army of the Republic, the Galactic Empire, the Alliance to Restore the Republic, aka the Rebels, and the Confederacy of Independent Systems. So first up, the ones that started it all, the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Now some YouTubers would have you believe that the CIS was a well-organized, full and proper military, and I disagree. The Confederacy was a hodgepodge of lowest bidder, mass-produced military assets placed under the command of a differing warlord throughout the course of the war, from General Grievous to Admiral Trench. The CIS fleet was a mix of trade federation, techno union, banking clan, and corporate alliance investments, not a properly structured and trained military. This can best be seen when looking at the different capital ships and ground units of the CIS, such as the Trade Federation's massive looser hulks, or the Providence class, the Techno Union's massive droid ground army of B1s and B2 droids, which, funny enough, the Techno Union claimed neutrality during most of the Clone Wars, even while millions of its B1s and B2s fought on every front line of the war. Anyways, continuing on with their unit list, the Commerce Guild brought with it the Recusant class light destroyer, aka the Commerce Guild destroyer, which, I'm going to use as my primary example and horse-beating target of how awful the CIS combat force truly was. The Commerce Guild Destroyer had a habit of actually running into other ships, even more so during a combat operation, due to the reliance of a droid tech brain that was known for being incredibly slow in response time. Just what you want in your Commerce Transport vessel that'd be traveling busy hyperspace lanes, or say, navigating an infinitely more complex combat engagement. The droid armies had a massive advantage over their opponent, the Galactic Republic, and the ability to replace and grow their military at an extraordinary rate due to it largely being made up of replaceable and cheap droids and its reliance on standardization. But as with the Recusant, or the B1s, this came with some obvious flaws. You see, the Star Wars universe runs off a technology I lovingly called 70s future tech. Big buttons, awful low resolution screens, and unless you're R2-D2, fairly sad processing speeds. Their largest capital ship, the Looser Hulk, was literally a converted large scale transport. Going back to our Commerce Guild destroyer though, it was painfully stubborn of a ship that would continue to attack a target well beyond the point when any sentient command officer or crew member would have backed down and fallen back to safety for repairs and a rearm, meaning these ships would stay in a fight long after they stopped being combat effective. The would-be separatist military had to replace far more ships than any other faction on this list for very little gain. Compare that to, say, the other side of the spectrum, the Rebel Alliance, who throughout the course of the war became an organization of experts at utilizing every scrap of resource and intelligence they could get their hands on. Or the Empire, who would grow to field an incredible collection of very specialized units in the field and operate on decades of lessons learned by combat veterans of the Clone Wars, turning those lessons, hard learned lessons, into standard galaxy-wide SOPs, or standard operating procedures. Sure, some ships, like the Providence class, had sentient command officers, but when the majority of your fleet is operated by droids, and almost 100% of your ground force is artificial, it leaves you with a military almost incapable of surprising its enemies, unable to make the most of its given assets, as we've seen time and time again in the Clone Wars, and unable to keep up with the Republic's ability to adapt and change to the needs of the war. So let's look at the other side of the Clone Wars, one of my favorite military organizations, the Grand Army of the Republic. For the most part, the Republic Army was made up of legions of clone troopers backed up by an already established, if in mostly disrepair, Republic Navy who would later become more and more reliant on clone enlisted and clone officers. The Republic operated from a rule book that was constantly being rewritten throughout its entire fight against the Separatists, something that we actually get to see pretty damn well starting with Episode 2 and throughout the Clone Wars series and into Episode 3. Just look at the change in gear and equipment from the Episode 2 movie to the end of the Clone Wars from the disaster that was the invasion of Geonosis 
A victory for sure for the Republic, but at an incredibly high cost. The Republic in the early days suffered from, well, Jedi generals with little in the way of tactical experience, who deployed clones in mass, even sending in clone commandos to operate in the field in open warfare with the average clone trooper, causing the commando program to be almost completely wiped out in the first major battle of the war. These were specialized troops that they just didn't know how to use. But by the end of the late battles of the Clone Wars, the Republic was an impressive array of warships and experienced clone veterans, something the droid army just couldn't keep up with. Though ground force tactics and gear changed quickly, space-borne war platforms changed very little. The Venator battleship, for instance, was the primary warship of the Republic throughout its fight with the CIS. Though a great multi-purpose platform that allowed the Republic to lay down heavy anti-ship or capital ship weapons fire and to carry its own ground troops and more advanced and generally better at fighter squadrons like the V-Wing, the ARC-170, and the better shielded Y-Wing, they could definitely outperform their separatist counterparts who focused on pure numbers like the Vulture Fighter and the Hyena Bomber. The Republic never managed to really upgrade its supporting fleet before the Empire was founded. They remain focused on using the Arquintans, the Counselor class, the Acclimator transport, and a number of other small vessels as their naval support, meaning the CIS always knew what would be fielded and how best to counter it. Most battles turned into slugfests of Venators and Providence classes, surrounded by the same four or so subclass ships before orbit of a planet could be secured and then ground invasion would begin, wash, rinse, and repeat. Just look at the Outer Rim Sieges as an example. The Republic tactics were simple compared to the outright chess games that ended up being the Galactic Civil War. Speaking of the Galactic Civil War, the first decade after the rise of the Empire would be what I'd consider the strongest point of the Galactic Empire. Sure, we'd later see massive Super Star Destroyers being fielded, and more advanced TIE Fighter variants get wider use, and much more territory would be under the thumb of the Emperor. The Empire's ability to produce capital ships and replace the ships that they had lost would grow greater and greater, getting nearer and nearer to the Battle of Yavin. But those early days saw units like the 501st supported with experienced naval crews aboard Star Destroyers, not to mention a galaxy that still looked largely at the Empire as a conquering hero bringing peace. The Empire focused on continuing the lessons of the Clone Wars. Those SOPs we mentioned earlier, those standard operating procedures, slowly turned from something that was constantly evolving and changing to be more dogmatic and rigid. The shift from a proper warfighting navy and military turned into an occupying force. The Star Destroyer became bigger and larger and more powerful and slower with the ISD-2s coming off the line. They became much more rigid, just like those operating them. Unlike the Alliance to Restore the Republic, who operated much looser in the form of tactics and standard procedures. Once something was deemed untenable, the Rebels would just throw it out and adapt. They kept the lessons learned from the Clone Wars and focused on survivability, maneuverability, and firepower in equal measure. Even their fastest interceptor still had some light shielding. This allowed the Rebel Alliance to capitalize on the Empire's slow response times and inability to deal with situations that didn't fit inside a pre-planned procedure. Even worse, the Rebel Alliance was made up of many Imperial officers, meaning they knew what the standard procedure was and used them against the Empire time and time again. The Imperial Navy was slow and designed to fight an enemy they defeated almost a decade prior. Even in its early days, could fight toe-to-toe -to -toe in a line battle against the Separatists or even the Republic, fielding massive swarms of fighters that could rival that of the droid armies in pure numbers and had the benefit of faster reflexes of trained Imperial officers. Its ISD fleet could stand without issue against a mighty Providence class. The focus on survivability of the Republic was just starting to get a handle on was dropped for mass production. The TIE Fighter was the fighter of choice. Much like everything in the Imperial Navy, it was a symbol of the Empire and a symbol designed to instill fear, but not to fight its enemies. So what about the Rebel Alliance then? And this is where my opinion differs greatly from Eckhart's Ladder, the Templin Institute, Space Dock, the Alliance focuses on flexibility. Days after Mon Mothma announced the Declaration of Rebellion, a large number of worlds announced their intention to leave the Empire, even with Mon Mothma and the other Rebel commanders telling them not to. Of course, the Imperial response was swift and deadly, but it showed the level of support the Alliance started with. The Alliance focuses on high-quality fighters, the T-65X Wing, the A-Wing, the B-Wing, and even the ancient Y-Wing, which was a far cry more durable than the TIE Bomber. Their capital ship fleet and ground forces had the one thing that every other military in this list fails at, variety. 
The Rebel Alliance took full advantage of the fact that its forces was made up of hundreds of different worlds, utilizing the different strengths, be it on the ground or in deep space. Speed of the Curlian Blockade Runner, the shield technology and tankiness of the massive Mon Calamari MC series like the MC-80s and the MC-40s. Even stealing or retrofitting ships that serve mission-critical purposes far better than anything mass-produced, cheaply-built, issued vehicle could handle, like a modified YT series, for instance, which we see many examples of in the Rebel Alliance. The focus on survivability the Republic had learned served the Rebel Alliance well. Many of its key leaders would come up from the ranks and from the trenches, being experienced leaders who were put in position because of their ability and not for their ability to play the political game. This boon of having experienced veteran troops was something the Imperial Navy largely lost out on as the Navy got larger and expanded out. By the time of the Galactic Civil War, many of its leaders would be put in place because of those political games. Thrawn being excluded, of course. As you can see, just by reading any of the Thrawn novels, what a proper commander can do with one of those navies. But that's not the empire that we ended up getting. So let's do this. Best military. Here's my list. First up, I'm sure you've guessed it, the Rebel Alliance. With its focus on strong fighters, working tactics to defeat its current enemy, and a large base of support that was spread out, and the strength of embracing the diversity it was built from, it's the best military at the big three. The Alliance is uniquely suited to adapt quickly with fewer casualties. The Galactic Republic would be my second choice. The strengths of the Empire and the Rebel Alliance stem from this organization. It had the largest number of veterans in its military structure. It was quick to adapt its fighting force as the war progressed, but it lacked the variety of its fleet makeup. My third would be the Empire. Starting with the largest base of capable capital ships, large, monstrous capital ships, and many ships designed for particular purposes that they excelled at. Individual capital ship capability is more than impressive when it comes to the Empire, but they lacked proper fighter support and the poor design of an ISD class shows the weakness of an organization looking to bring fear and not true warfighting capability to the front line. Lastly, and I think this is different than any other list I've seen so far, the CIS. It's basically an example of what happens when you build an army based on the lowest bidder. The highest numbers don't always make up for the inability to adapt and be flexible. And it's literally the lowest IQ per military unit on this list. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's my list for which Star Wars faction has the best military. Now, the whole point of videos like this, in my opinion, is it it's a fun mental exercise to talk about this universe, particularly from the perspective of being in this universe. There are few franchises that allow us to look at an organization or a galaxy like this and see how it progressed from one form to the next and how these different militaries have very unique styles and I would never change anything about any of them. They all fit perfectly into what they're supposed to be and I love it that way. But it's fun to have these conversations so let's keep it clean in the comments below. I look forward to reading them. Let me know what your thoughts are. What's your best rated, not your favorite military, that's a totally different subject. This is the best military at its job. Favorite military, totally different thing. All right, let me know in the comments. I look forward to reading them. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel for more sci-fi gaming and modding goodness. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.